You're watching LMCC, your community TV. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for everybody coming out tonight, or sh I should say coming in tonight on this beautiful night. Uh, I've been here for the last 10 days. I spent uh, Fourth of July week up north at my sister's cabin. I have to go back to Connecticut tomorrow and I feel like my, my carriage is turning back into a pumpkin because I've got to go, not home, even though that's where I've lived for the last 15 years, where my four kids are being raised, but uh, I still consider the Twin Cities in Minnesota home. And uh, I wasn't born here. Dan Barrero said yesterday in KFAN that I can't truly be considered a Minnesotan because I wasn't born here, but uh, they're willing to consider me a, a kind of a naturalized citizen of, of Minnesota. <laughs> but I was born in uh, suburban Chicago, and I had no intention of writing a memoir about growing up in Minnesota. I did what some of you may have done, which is on a cold winter's day in Connecticut, procrastinating on a writing deadline. I looked up the newspaper from the day I was born in the town that I was born. So I looked up the Chicago Tribune. I looked up the Chicago Tribune from September 22nd, 1966. You can all do the math in your heads now. I'm 51, I'll save you that. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I noticed, oh, um, the, the Chicago White Sox were playing the Yankees that night at Yankee Stadium and drew 420 people to a Major League Baseball game at Yankee Stadium. How is that possible? Well, the pennant races were over and people just stopped going to the games. At Wrigley Field, the, the Cubs had fewer than a thousand people. I saw an ad for a six pack of Old Style for 79 cents, which even for Old Style seemed cheap. <laughs> and, and I saw a display ad in the TV listings for the third episode of Star Trek. But I'm told by Star Trek uh, nerds that a lot of people consider it the first episode because that's where uh, Kirk and, and uh, Scotty were introduced or something like that. And that was airing on NBC around the time that I was born. I was born at around seven o'clock in the evening. And so it got me wondering, was my mom watching this <laughs> while in labor? Um, it would explain the Mr. Spock haircuts that I had as a kid in the 70s. And, um, and I just got me thinking about what was my life like when I was born, but before I was conscious, aware of being, you know, walking the earth. So I looked at the next day's paper, the next days, and by the, by the time I was through looking at a few weeks of papers, I thought, I want to write a book about reliving my childhood, basically. And I turned three in 1970, and I turned 13 in 1980, at the end of the 70s. So it's both a memoir of that prime time of childhood from the onset of memory to the onset of puberty, but also it coincides with the 70s, so it's, a, it's a sort of a cultural history of the 70s as well. And uh, you know, where do you start a book like this? And I, I don't like reading biographies, a thousand page biographies where we start with the great great grandparents and the covered wagon. I just want to get to the good parts. So. And my parents had told me this story many times earlier. We moved from Chicago, physically moved from Chicago to the Twin Cities when my dad was transferred, he worked for 3M. And he, was, he was called to the mothership in St. Paul. And we physically moved uh, from Lyle, Illinois to Bloomington in 1969. We stopped halfway, roughly halfway in Wisconsin Dells, stayed overnight, topped up our supply of rubber tomahawks and you know, uh, went to Fort Dells and all that. And then my parents put us to bed in the motel while they, my, my two older brothers and I, my mom was five months pregnant with my younger sister, Amy. I'm one of five kids. And they put us to bed and watched the moon landing. It was July 20th, 1969. And then the next morning, we got up, packed into a butterscotch colored Chevy Impala station wagon, and drove to Bloomington. And I was three at the time, not yet three, but it must have seemed to them like anything was possible because that was the first day you could use the phrase, we've put a man on the moon you know, why can't we do this? But think about how different that ride would have been. We were in the station wagon, my mom is pregnant, she's riding shotgun, I'm on her lap, acting as the airbag in the event of, a, of an accident. <laughs> Nobody's wearing seat belts, the speed limit is 75, people are throwing, and I remember this vividly, because we would drive back to Chicago every other summer, people, you know, you got your McDonald's bag, throw it out the window on the interstate, why not? 
Um, there was leaded gasoline. There, was, there were hitchhikers. And, uh, and all of that was the way the world was. We think of it as, you know, a relatively, at least I do, as, you know, as my lifetime. So it's modern times, but it's also very different, a very different time. And so I wanted to kind of re-inhabit that, that time. And I, my dad had always told me that my mom, moving from Chicago, she didn't want to move from Cincinnati where she grew up to Chicago. But when she'd been there for 10 years, she didn't want to move from Chicago to the Twin Cities, whatever they were. My dad pointed out today at the Twins game, the Fauché Tower there was the tallest building on the skyline in 1969 when we moved here. And I, I think to my mom, it wasn't quite like, you know, this big league city. But we had the Vikings, we had the Twins, we newly had the North Stars. Every Saturday night on CBS, Mary Tyler Moore would drive up what I assume was 35W, and uh, in America saw that. And, um, and so as a kid, only knowing this, I thought Bloomington in particular was the center of the universe. And, um, and the Vikings were a big part of that, going to the Super Bowl uh, more or less a few months after we arrived. And um, you know, I tell the story in the book that I sort of instantly became super invested in the Vikings. Uh, my favorite player was Alan Page, even though everybody else in the neighborhood had a Chuck Foreman 44 jersey or a Fran Tarkenton number 10 jersey. You couldn't buy an Alan Page jersey. But my mom, uh, one birthday, got a purple 88 jersey and put my name on the back. And it wasn't quite a Vikings jersey. It was, had gold hoops on the arm and gold letters, when, numbers when the Vikings had white. But it was good enough. And I, I wore that thing until it developed holes. And, um, you know, the Jerry Seinfeld line about men wear underwear until you can blow it away like dandelion spores. <laughs> that's, that's how I wore that shirt. And, um, and I went to Nativity of Mary in Bloomington. I went to Catholic school. All of my siblings did. We wore a uniform. Um, the only way you could distinguish yourself in great Catholic grade school was by your sneakers. So, you know, sneakers were so imp Gym shoes. My, my Connecticut children and their Twin Cities cousins here we're having this debate yesterday. They're, they're, my kids are saying they're sneakers, and, and my sister's kids are saying they're gym shoes, they're tennis shoes. And um, so my tennis shoes at, at Nativity, um, you know, gosh, could we just get Adidas? You know, three striped Adidas. My mom would show us the Sears winner with four stripes. Look, this is one more stripe. That's one better. And I'm like, this isn't a military rank. You know, one stripe doesn't make it one better. Um, so so yeah, that was the environment that, that I was living in as a kid. But uh, one of my classmates at Nativity, his dad uh, managed the airport Holiday Inn out, out by Met Stadium. And the Vikings stayed there on the Saturday nights before home games. And our, my classmate Troy invited me one Saturday night to sleep over at the Holiday Inn on the night before a Vikings game. And we could order room service milkshakes and you know, sit by the pool. And when the Vikings came in, we could get their autographs. And this just blew my mind. I, I was nervous about this for the couple of weeks leading up to this. And I wore my, my mom allowed me, this was such a special event that my mom allowed me to wear this moth-eaten Allen Page jersey to the Holiday Inn. And, uh, and when I got there, Troy's dad said to me, you know, if you stand over here and ask politely, you can get the autographs. And he turned to me in, with the obliviousness of grown-ups and said, except for Allen Page, he doesn't sign autographs, don't ask him. And I had been practicing in the mirror you know, what, what I was, please, Mr. Page, may I, please, Mr. Page, may I have your autograph? And, and I was devastated. I mean, I instantly, I was crushed. I remember to this day, and this was, you know, 42 years ago or something. And, um, and so I stood in the corner, but I got some Vikings autographs. Some of the pictures are in the book, a picture of me getting Nate Wright's autograph. They all come in with, you know, suede jackets and big bell bottoms and striped pants and big afros. And it was, you know, just blew my mind. And then the automatic doors, slide open and in walks Alan Page with this big afro, big collar, um, looking like, you know, big mutton chop sideburns. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even choke out the words, even though I know, knew I could no longer get his autograph. And he blew through the lobby. Even the older kids who were, you know, lobby lizards who would get autographs every week knew to step aside. And he walked past those kids. He walked past me. And out of the corner of his eye, something kind of caught his eye. And he turned to me and he came back. And he took the pen out of my trembling hand and signed my notebook paper, handed it back to me, and then he disappeared up the, um, up the stairwell. There's like a you know, two-story Holiday Inn. And I just stood there shaking in a, in a puddle of flop sweat and, and uh, gratitude. And, and you know, that was uh, 
uh, a moment of my life, you know, when I set, set out to write this book, like I, I just started writing down memories, and the first ten come immediately, and that's, you know, that's probably number one of what I remember of being a little kid in Bloomington, and I've been a writer for Sports Illustrated for 30 years, and maybe 15 of those years ago, the magazine for a Where Are They Now issue sent me to St. Paul to interview Alan Page, Supreme Court Justice. And you know, halfway through this interview, in his chambers at the, at the State Supreme Court, I started telling him the story that I just told you, and I said, but I proceeded by saying, was there a time when you didn't sign autographs? And he said, well, that's true. He said, I, I didn't see the value in that. He said, I would have ha be happy to have a conversation with somebody, but they didn't want that. You'd be at the orchestra, they'd tap you on the shoulder and just hand a piece of paper. He said, there's no human connection there. Um, I'd talk to somebody for five minutes before I'd sign an autograph for them. And so I told him the story, and he kind of hung in suspense for a little bit. And then when I got to the part where he signs the autograph, he was relieved. And uh, <laughs> because he realized at some point that it was just easy to sign the autograph. You know, people don't understand your motivations. And um, a couple of weeks later, and I told him about my moth eaten Alan Page jersey, and a couple of weeks later in the mail, I got a note from him and a a 1970 three-quarter sleeve white road Vikings 88 jersey, um, you know, signed across the chest. And, and I, I, only, I didn't want to put it in a frame. I didn't want to leave it in a closet. I, I break it out every Halloween and dress as my favorite superhero, Alan Page, and, and wear it once a year for that, for that reason. But um, and when the book came out last summer, um, he, he, uh, he texted or emailed me that, um, that he really wanted to come to the, the reading that I did last summer when a book came out in Minneapolis, but as a, as a quintessential Minnesotan, um, he and his wife, Diane, were going to be up north at their cabin. So I said, that's a, that's a, a, a legit doctor's excuse if you're going up north. But uh, I did go to his house before the reading, and I got to sign a book to him. You know, 40 years later, I get to sign something for you, but what a difference in my life that made. So. Um, but that was what, you know, growing up to me in Bloomington was. I was wide-eyed, it was the center of the universe. Um, you know, that old New Yorker cover where there's, there's, you know, midtown Manhattan, then Manhattan, then, you know, the outer boroughs, and then New Jersey, and then in the distance, the rest of the world. That's what, that's what the world was like to me. Southbrook, the subdevelopment I grew up in in Bloomington, then Central Bloomington and Lincoln High School and, and Nativity, our grade school, and then, you know, if we had to go, my brother was complaining yesterday he had to drive his daughter from South Minneapolis up to Monticello for a <laughs> soccer game. Well, to us, it was a long journey to go to East Bloomington, to Running Park, to, to have to play a, a BAA uh, Athletic Association game. Um, Eden Prairie was a day's journey by covered wagon. And, and um, I, going up north to us, honest to God, was, was going to South Minneapolis. I, I barely ever went to Lake Harriet until I was in high school and I, and I could ride a bike there. We were a family of indoorsmen. Uh, unique in Minnesota. If we didn't hunt, my dad didn't fish, we didn't have a cabin, never camped. Um, and uh, so that was, that was I, I, possibly because of that, I remember every TV commercial, every jingle. Um, the book is full of you know, the TV shows that, that uh, I can't shake and I, I would go back and watch DVDs did this really happen? Yes, I, that coincides with my memory. Charlie's Angels really did have a, you know, prison delousing scene. You know, when I was 12 years old, that you know, I vividly recall. And um, and, and then the, the pop cultural stuff from that era. So uh, the very first movie I ever saw, 1972. And I, I, in hindsight, these things make sense when you're looking back on your life. 1972. Uh, fall of 72, The Poseidon Adventure came out. Fall of 72, my youngest brother was born. And I now, now know that my mother sent my dad and all of the kids out of the house. I don't care what you do, just get out of here. Um, you know, when she had a newborn and four other kids. And he took us to the Southtown Theater to see The Poseidon Adventure. And the Southtown Theater, if some of you may remember, was 1,000 seats. It was like a Hollywood, uh, you know, premiere theater with a red carpet and Klieg lights. And, and yet, you know, it was in the middle of Bloomington. It was 494 and Penn. And, uh, it's crossed from Target, it was, it was, but it was, it was you know, a place that looked like it was right out of a, a Hollywood premiere. And we walked into the lobby and, and um, this blood red carpet and the candy counter with the milk duds and the raisinettes and it's clear like a jeweler's case. And then you see the, uh, the poster for the Poseidon Adventure and it says, hell, upside down. Well, this is, I'm six years old. 
I'm six years old. So we go in and the opening titles, and I had to watch the Poseidon Adventure again, again to reconcile it with my memories. Before the movie starts, there is a, a, a title card that comes up and says, uh, you know, the Poseidon, the SS Poseidon, I don't know that this is made up, the SS Poseidon capsized on such and such year. Uh, there were very few survivors. This is their story. So you know before the movie starts that almost everybody in the movie dies. And that, that's a great thing for a six-year-old in a dark theater surrounded by a thousand seats to see. And um, at some point, uh, you know, one of the main characters, Gene Hackman, leads them up an inverted Christmas tree to, they have to get to the top of the, the, the inverted ship. And, uh, you know, the women, for some reason, have to take off, like, the skirt and the high heels. And the men remain, you know, fully in tuxedo and stuff while they climb up the Christmas tree. And, um, you know, it was, it was not something a six-year-old really would have, uh, but that was, that was the time. Four years later, five, three years later, uh, we were begging my dad to take us to see Jaws. He, he wouldn't. Uh, I read reviews in the, in the LA Times, uh, various reviews since then, writing the book about what, an, what a terrifying uh, ordeal it is for young children. Don't take young children, you know. Your 13-year-old might be able to comprehend it well. I'm nine, and one night my mom's hosting Bridge Cup, and my dad announces, we're going out to Corner Plaza to buy underwear for back to school. And okay, we leave, and he takes a left, he takes a right turn at Corner Plaza and drives to the boulevard and in blood red letters, Jaws on the marquee. And you know, he takes us in, a, I can't believe this is happening. We asked for this, but we didn't really want to do this. And, <laughs> and now, you know, there it is on the beach. There's a skinny dipper, and now there's a severed arm, and there's a crab crawling across the. And it's like, what? I, I, I mean, I hesitate to go into detail because it will give me nightmares again. But that was uh, <laughs> these pop cultural things were burned into my brain, um, you know, from from that age. And you're impressionable at that age in any era, but that particular era, as many of you remember, people didn't want. I didn't want to swim in Bush Lake after seeing Jaws. <laughs> um, I wasn't taking any chances. And then some of the cultural artifacts that just stuck in my mind from, uh, from the 70s. The book is called Stingray Afternoons because my uh, holy grail was to get a Schwinn Stingray bike. And like a lot of things that my, my dad, God bless him, did, he knew a guy who could get it, you know, get it cheaper. Well, it wasn't quite a Stingray, it was a CCM Mustang. <laughs> But, uh, you know, so I got a kind of a Stingray, but it was still a muscle bike that kind of looked like the motorcycles that e Evil Knievel rode. And, uh, and um, so that was, a, that was a big thing, the, the Stingray bike. Um, uh, the Bic Pen, the Bic Pen, when I was thinking about the objects that sort of captivated me as a kid, every kid had the blue-capped Bic see-through uh, clear pen. And you could remove the ink stem, take the cap off, remove that little blue plug, plug at the end of it, and use it as a spitball uh, shooter. And we'd wad up little pieces of Mead notebook paper and we'd put them in the barrel of the big pen and shoot them at uh, each other during class. And um, at Nativity, there was still a nun in fifth grade and she kept on her desk a, a, like a clay jar of odds and ends that she called her nut cup. And of course, when you're in fifth grade, that made everybody <laughs> giggle and the more she said it, the more we would just, you know, we couldn't believe it. Um, you know, put, are you chewing gum? Put that, wrap that, put that in the nut cup. And, uh, and uh, so you know, she'd have her back turned, she, you know, people were shooting spitballs and they'd land on, who did this? And, but you turn around, there was, it was a perfect alibi because everybody had a blue Bic pen. And, and my life sort of came full circle when I was doing a column for Sports Illustrated on professional WWE wrestling. And at the time, the world champion was a guy named Triple H. And he, this was down in Atlanta. They were doing Monday Night Raw or something, and he was showing me, literally showing me the ropes and where they come in and how they, how they do these things. And, and I said to him, I said, Mr. H, I don't know, Triple, what do I call you? I said, what would you call me? If I were, if I were to come to WWE today and you guys had to make, up a, make me into a villain or something, what would I be? What would my ring name be? And I didn't prepare him for this at all. He looked me up and down. In five seconds, he said, tall, bald, skinny, a writer. We'd put a little blue cap on you and call you the ballpoint pen. You could go around staining people. <laughs> so I was proud of that because the big pen looms so large in my childhood. Um, and one other thing, one other kind of object, it's more than an object, but that captivated me as a kid from the 70s was um, the, the Boeing 747. I mean, this gigantic wide-body airplane that uh, 
had its maiden voyage in January of 1970, so it, it, was, it was a product of the 70s in the same way that I was. Um, it gave me dreams of going somewhere across the world, but also the glamour of, it seems silly to say now, having, as I wait my middle seat and coach tomorrow, the glamour of, of airline travel, but that's what it spoke to me, with a spiral staircase to an upstairs piano lounge. And, um, and when I was you know, doing the research for this book, and my dad, when, he moved, when we moved to the Twin Cities, he started having to travel a lot internationally for 3M. And I asked him if he remembered his first 747 flight, and he said, I absolutely do. And I said, well, tell me. And he said, well, they had the upstairs lounge, a bar upstairs, and um, unprecedented. You could just go up to a bar, and instead of sitting in your seat on the flight, you could sit at the bar all night. So that he and his boss at the time flew from Minneapolis to Paris on his first international 747 flight, and he said, and I remember they had a green liqueur called, uh, called uh, Green Chartreuse, I think it was called. Um, it's in the book that they, served, that they served up there, and it was a French liqueur, and they just sat there at the bar drinking that, and uh, you know, day turned to night, night turned to morning, and they got off the plane, and um, in those days before airport security, the, the 3M French guy in Paris was there to meet them, to take them at 8 a.m. on their day's round of meetings. And my dad's boss said, no, you don't understand. We can't go to, we can't, we can't make this one. We need to get aspirin and water now. And this guy was looking at, and my dad said, he vividly remembers this guy looking at them thinking, how did these two guys, these two Americans arrive completely blotto in Paris at 8 o'clock in the morning. And that was thanks to the 747. So, so uh, you know, I had these dreams of travel. The travel, uh, eventually we did take a family trip to California in 1977, but most of the travel, most of the family trips we took were in the wood-paneled Ford Country Squire station wagon, which is the other sort of iconic um, uh, vehicle of, of my childhood. My dad hated that car. Um, we drove it, we would drive to Chicago and Cincinnati where my mom was from every other summer. And, um, and you know, somebody would be getting sick in the back of it. Somebody would, uh, uh, you know, it was, always, it was always something going on. If who, fighting over who got to sit where, who got to lie across the hump, the drive train and feel the vibrations, you know, and <laughs> are we there yet? And my kids complain about, you know, they've seen the 20 DVDs on the DVD player or, you know, their, their iPod is dying. Well, you want, a, you want, you want, you want a, a boring car trip, drive to Cincinnati in the back of a wagon for two days in the Ford Country Squire. So my dad announced in 19, summer of 1976 that next summer we're, we're going to California and we're flying there. And, uh, and California was kind of the holy grail. I mentioned the Schwinn is the holy grail. It was sort of the, the, uh, the great destination for us because that's where TV came from. And, uh, you know, Starsky and Hutch lived in, in California. We flew to San Francisco, and there was the streets of San Francisco. Where's Michael Douglas and, and Carl Malden? I'm gonna see all these guys. I'm gonna see uh, Chips, the California Highway Patrol, and those blue license plates with the gold number, letters and numbers, and uh, California was, you know, uh, the place you wanna be, as they said in the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, and so when we got there, I, I just thought we would be seeing celebrities and, and uh, meeting rock stars, and of course that didn't happen, but we did get to go to Universal Studios and take the tour and we, we met our, our one celebrity of the trip, which was Fred the Cockatoo from Beretta, the trained bird. <laughs> and it didn't occur to me that there were like a dozen trained cockatoos and trained Fred the Cockatoo. So, um, so when we were leaving, we're, LAX, uh, I, I still see this in slow motion. Who knows if it happened the way I remember it, but uh, uh, you know, your memory plays tricks on you, but this is how I vividly remember being at LAX on our last day in California. We had. We had gone to a, a work colleague of my dad's in Anaheim Hills, and this kid had long hair, and he had a skateboard, and, you know, God, these kids in California are so cool, and now I've got to go back to Minnesota, and, you know, and, uh, and we were at the airport, and these guys started walking through the airport in silk, sort of, uh, you know, silk, like, kind of like rock band jackets of the 70s, with the sleeves pushed up, these skinny guys with long hair, and it was, I mean, two people may remember this name, but it was Al Stewart in his band, and I thought, Al Stewart, the year of the cat. That's, that's Rod Stewart's brother. It's not Rod Stewart's brother, as it turns out, but I didn't know that. So I, I got to see Al Stewart 
Rod Stewart's not really his brother, but you know, what did I know? And then when we got back to Minnesota, my brother and I pitched in our money. We went to Westwood Skate and Bike, and we bought a lime green skateboard with state-of-the-art, brand new polyurethane wheels. So if you hit a pebble, it would just roll right over. And I was the chicken, he was the daredevil. We got it, we immediately took it to the top of Normandale Hill, where Normandale Col Junior College is the highest hill in Bloomington. My brother was gonna go first. He went bombing down on it, hit a pebble, Skateboard immediately locked up. He shot off. Skateboard stayed where it was. He broke his arm. My mom took the skateboard. We didn't see it again. And uh, I was relieved because then I didn't have to ride it and I was the chicken. But, uh, but then I came to accept again that, that Bloomington was, you know, uh, as great a place as, as you could possibly uh, want to grow up. And, uh, and since I've seen the rest of the world since, I, I've confirmed that. But, um, uh, you know, one, one, one other thing that kind of was you know, bespoke the 70s and, and my childhood was, you know, we wanted the Adidas with three stripes, but we always also wanted Levi's. The cords had to be Levi's. The jeans, could they be Levi's? You know, and I'm, well, no, you know, these are kind of like Levi's. They have a tag. No, no, these aren't Levi's. And we had this conversation when at dinner, my oldest brother, who was uh, in high school at the time, said, you don't need Levi's. It's, you're just paying extra for the tag. And I, and I, and I said to him, in a, in a precursor of my being a cynical journalist, I said, "Well, you've got Levi's. I, I, you know, you're just wearing for the no. They're the only they're the only cords and jeans that fit me. But you know, you don't need them. You know." And so, uh, so I went after dinner. I went down to the basement where his his Levi's were drying over the the clothesline in the basement, and I and I took up my one of my dad's pliers off the tool bench, workbench, and I and I ripped the the tag out like I was pulling a tooth, and then I brought his his Levi's up, and I said, "Well, since." since you don't need the tag, here, I, I've torn the tag out. And not only did he go crazy, and he was huge, he had the bench press record at Lincoln High School, he went on to play a hockey scholarship at Providence College. He, he uh, my, my parents kind of blindly turned the other cheek, like whatever, whatever he does, he's got to come into him. And, 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 you know, as the middle of five kids, I was on the receiving end of that a lot. So one of his favorite torments was, uh, uh, you know, there was the old Hertz donut. You, do you want a Hertz donut? What's a Hertz donut? Punching you in the arm and saying, Hertz, donut. And um, my kids love that. And, uh, but his favorite thing was the 99 bumps. So he would, he would uh, pin me down by, with his knees on my biceps, my, my cooked spaghetti biceps. And he would give me 99, with the raised knuckle of his right hand, he would give me 99 shots to the sternum. But of course, he'd get to about 38 and he'd forget, he'd lose count where he was and he'd start over. And, uh, you know, and then I visited these, the same things on my, my younger brother. My younger brother, when he was uh, maybe three years old and we have pictures, there's a picture in the book from a, a still from a home movie, we would, we would play hockey in the basement. We'd set him up in the goal and we would just rifle tennis balls at him as hard as we could. And uh, he had a, uh, like an oven mitt and a, we taped a piece of wood paneling <laughs> onto a hockey glove as a blocker. And, and he'd get in his socks and he'd rough up the crease and uh, we'd rifle tennis balls at him. And, and um, that kid, by the way, when he graduated from high school, was drafted in the seventh round by the New York Rangers. So we always tell him, you know, we made you what you are. Is this? <laughs> but we also made my sister because she was the second youngest of the five. And um, she told the story all through her child, all through her adolescence and adulthood. And it, I put it in the book. Um, when you know, if the if the tennis ball went under the furnace or behind the ping pong table or was even, if you even had to bend down to retrieve it from someplace, we would just use something else. We get another tennis ball or rolled up socks or whatever it was. And she came down the stairs to the basement, which you're always sort of afraid to go into the basement in the first place unless there were people down there. She kind of gingerly came down the stairs and looked, and we were playing hockey with the the severed head of her, of her baby tender love doll, which um, I wasn't responsible for doing, but, but um, it was her only doll and she was horrified and, and if she were to write her own book, that would be you know, probably the centerpiece of it. So my dad reassured her that he could fix baby tender love and you know, with a hot glue gun and some bad cosmetic surgery, he got the head back attached and the hair on and it looked worse than it did you know, with the head off. But she is now, an emergency room doctor at North Memorial, so I also tell her she should be thanking us and giving us a, paying us a commission for, for putting in, her in that line of work. Um, and, you know, writing a memoir, this is your, these are your memories, this is your um, perspective, and I always say that if my oldest brother were to write a memoir, 
you know, this, he was the, the scary, you know, uh, brute. And I've had people say, you know, do you talk to your old? I said, talk to him. I talked to him yesterday. Yeah, we all, this is how we all express our love for one another is by, you know, giving shots to the sternum. But if, if he were to write his own book, I wouldn't even be, I probably wouldn't even be mentioned in it, you know, because <laughs> I was nothing. I was a little kid and, and he was off, you know, riding away from me. So, um, you know, these are the, um, you know, these are, when I, when I say I started to write the book, I didn't have an intention of writing a book, but I just looked into the newspapers from the day I was born, because you don't feel like when you grow up in a house like this, that is like so many other houses. Um, I wasn't abused as a kid. I wasn't, you know, I didn't run off and join the circus. I didn't have any kind of crazy childhood, but it seems to have resonated with a lot of people who had similar childhood. Some people think my childhood was crazy just because of, you know, having all these siblings and we were constantly fighting and our family portrait that my oldest brother arranged to give to my parents on their wedding anniversary has me with a big black eye because my brother Tom had, and I had gotten in a fight the, the day before the portrait was taken. But uh, that still hangs in my dad's condo and I, I wouldn't want it any other way, you know. Um, but uh, so I didn't have the, I, did, I never would have proposed it as a, as a memoir um, until uh, the publisher said, you know, this is a memoir both of the 70s but also of your, of your you know, your specific childhood in Bloomington, Minnesota. And the fact that it's resonated with other people shows me that a lot of other people have this sort of uh, uh, normal slash dysfunctional, um, you know, upbringing. And uh, I just read today on my phone that uh, the latest endangered species is the middle child. So many families are having two children now that there's an older sibling and a younger sibling. And, uh, and the middle child, who they described as the peacekeeper, the quiet one, all this stuff, uh, is, is, uh, is dwindling in numbers. And, and um, you know, I don't know that I was, I certainly wasn't a peacekeeper. I was just trying to stay out of the, the crossfire. Um, but I do think one of the reasons I became a writer was I was observing all this chaos and craziness that was going on around us. And by the time I was in middle school, I was actually starting to write some of this stuff down. So I would write stories about uh, twins games I watched on TV in our basement. I would wa write uh, stories about basketball games we played in the driveway. And, um, and I, my mom had a royal typewriter. You bang the keys like you were trying to ring the bell in the Carnival Midway. You had to hammer them down. And, uh, and then I wouldn't show the stories to anybody. I'd put them in a file. Sometimes I'd throw them away. And one day I came home from school and my mom had fished the, the, uh, a story that I'd written out of the wastebasket in my bedroom. And when I arrived home from school, her bridge club was passing it around and reading it. And I was horrified, angry, flop sweating. This is probably sixth grade. And, uh, but they said nice things about it. And, and so that was the first time I had an, an, you know, a readership of you know, three people, and two of whom weren't my mom. And so they, they weren't required as technically to say nice things. So um, when I went to college and, um, and moved to New York and started the Sports Soldier as a fact checker, I uh, became a baseball writer at SI when Peter Gammons abruptly left and I was thrown under the baseball beat, didn't know what I was doing, didn't know how to rent a car or buy an airplane ticket. But that year, after writing baseball every week for, from February to October, the Twins were in the World Series, 1991. And I was living in New York, but, but the World Series was in Minneapolis and Atlanta. And games six and seven were Saturday, Sunday in Minneapolis. And instead of staying in a hotel, I stayed in the house that I grew up in in Bloomington. And Sunday night when the Twins won this great one nothing game with Jack Morris pitching a shutout and uh, the city's going crazy. And I, I got in my rental car and drove back to Bloomington. And I wrote the cover story for Sports Illustrated, not on my mom's royal typewriter, but on a laptop in the same basement at the same table in front of the same portable TV where I'd write those stories as a kid. So my, I always say that the lesson is, particularly if you set the bar low enough, you can achieve your dreams because I'm, <laughs> I'm living proof. And um, you know, I, I love the line from the comedian actress Lily Tomlin who said, um, you know, I always dreamed of being someone when I grew up. Now I wish I had been more specific, you know? And I guess <laughs> we all turn out to be someone as it turns out, but, uh, um, but that's what I wanted to do. I, I, I read, I, I, uh, we got Sports Illustrated as a gift subscription for my aunt in Cincinnati. And, um, and I got in my head that you know, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to be. And then when I was 13, in what was just one gigantic OSHA violation, I got a job at Met Stadium. And my two older brothers worked there. And the way you got a job at the Met was your older brother, oldest brother 
rode his bike to the house of a guy named Smoke in East Bloomington, <laughs> asked him if he could get a job at the Met. Smoke, with a cigar, kind of looked you up and down and said, yeah, sure, whatever. And then he got my brother Tom a job. Tom got me a job. So as a result, on my 13th birthday, I, got, I had an employee pass for the Minnesota Twins, and I worked Twins and Vikings games for the last three years at Met Stadium. And we would make the hot dogs and the sodas that the vendors took around. We worked in the commissary. And after seven innings, you were free to go home, or you could watch the game. And when it rained, you know, I, this, this Statue of Limitations is over on this. When it rained, we would leave, we would stop making the hot dogs with our bare hands, and we would go pull the tarp across the infield. That's how cheap Calvin was. And, <laughs> and then we would run back in, and we would start throwing hot dogs back in the boiling water and, uh, and do it all over again. So I got to work, and you know, even at 13, I had a sense that there's no better job than this. You can't, this is the best that we'll ever get. You know, I'm, I'm like a child actor who peaked at, at 13. And um, you would walk in this Willy Wonka factory of, of baseball. There'd be broken bats, there'd be pallets of beer, you know, grain belt bottles, and there would be uh, uh, the smell of pine tar, and guys would be rocketing batting practice balls into the stands, and they, you would just walk over and pick one up. Hey, here's a Major League Baseball. Stick it in your pocket. And, uh, and we got to do that for Twins games, Vikings games, um, concerts. My oldest brother worked the famous, not this recent Eagles Jimmy Buffett concert, but he worked the famous Eagles, uh, uh, Pablo Cruz, um, Steve Miller Band concert. He was the only guy there who thought Pablo Cruz should be headlining. I, I mean, and, and that was another kind of, when I talk about movies and TV and commercial jingles, you know, I, I can't remember my own anniversary, but I can remember CNH, pure cane sugar from Hawaii, growing in the sun. Uh, some reason that that stuff never leaves me. Um, here's the good friends. Tonight is kind of special. The beer will pour. Must say something more. Somehow, some of you can complete the uh, you know let it be low and brow. And uh, and um, but the music. You know the music. I writing this book. I listened to the 70s on seven on satellite radio for a couple of years. It was so so. Um, bewitching to me, anyway, that my now 13-year-old knows far more about 70s music than she does about current pop, and I'm, I'm sure she'll be telling that to a psychiatrist someday, but, uh, <laughs> but my brother, my oldest brother, had these albums, Hotel California. You know, he stabbed it with a steely knife, but you just can't kill the beast. It freaked me out. Listening to that in the dark in the basement, and the only light was the graphic equalizer bars going up and down the stereo. Nights in white satin, you know? Cold-hearted orb that rules the night, and we, we, it was like holding your hand over a flame. God, can I listen to the end of this? I, I, I turn it off. I don't want to hear it. Uh, the night Chicago died, you know, where the dad bursts through the door at the end of the song, and he's still alive, and you, ah, you're so happy, even though you've heard the song 40 times, and you know how it turns out. So um, all of these things, you know, remained imprinted in my brain. Unfortunately, to the to the uh, loss of all the important stuff in my brain, and putting it down on paper was uh, was. Um, you know, therapeutic in many ways. And, um, you know, I, I want to leave time for questions. The, the last sort of memory that, that pops out at me uh, when I sat down to write this book was, um, and it's the opposite for me today, and particularly since I've been on the road for a week and a half with, with all, or in, in the last few days, just two of my kids, it was the, the um, exhilaration of, you know, can we, can we go out tonight? Can we go out to eat tonight? You know, no. But every once in a while, every once in a crazy blue moon, yes, we're going out to eat tonight. We're going to Mr. Steak. We're going to Shakey's Pizza Parlor. We're going to get a straw uh, uh, styrofoam boater. And you know, your brother's going to punch a hole in it before we get home or take a bite out of the brim just to <laughs> anger you. But we're going out to eat. And, um, and, and you know, uh, I, I, you know, if you're going to write a book, um, you have to write about, you should choose a subject that you want to, you know, the research and the writing has to be the fun part because it's great when you see the cover of the book, it's great when the book comes out and you're happy for a couple of days, but 99.9% .9 of it is the writing of it, the doing of it. I heard an author say, and she was dead right, she said, you know, tomorrow my book is published, so tonight is the calm before the calm, you know, because it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you're not walking a red carpet when the book comes out. And so, you know, watching these, TV shows, uh, listening to this music, um, talking to my grade school friends, and just reliving this stuff was, was uh, to me, if nobody bought the book, if nobody read the book, I would have had that experience, and my ridiculous uh, 
family photos, you know, that book, Awkward Family Photos, well, this book is full of them, would at least be preserved between hardcovers. So it's been super gratifying that people have read it and, and it's resonated with people of different ages, uh, different uh, geographical childhoods. And, uh, you know, I think at essence, the book, at least I was striving to make it a book, uh, regardless of where you grew up, regardless of when you grew up, you would recognize um, childhood in it, and particularly that hopefully if you had a happy childhood, that most innocent prime time of, you know, when you, when your memory kicks in in kindergarten or whenever it is to, you know, when your voice changes and you start getting, you stop talking to your parents and all that, um, in between is that, uh, that time when, um, you know, innocence and, but also wonder at, you know, what is the world and everything is amazing or terrifying and having kids of myself uh, helped me informed it when I was writing and I'd forgotten things. So the way my son, and this happens every summer after we come back from up north, go back to Connecticut, every night when we're, when we're, we're in my sister's cabin, he'll say, Dad, I have 23 bug bites now. And he'll run his hand and he's, I've got a new one here. And it's like every night in bed, he'd like, it's like he's rereading the day in Braille by running his hands over his bug bites. <laughs> and I remember, so remember doing that as a kid or, or you know, now my kids don't have this, uh, don't have this experience because, of course, they put on a number 50 sunblock when they leave the house. But uh, I didn't, you know, we were putting on stuff to get you tan. We were putting on Crisco or whatever it was. <laughs> and so I would lie in bed and, you know, peel off uh, three square feet of skin and hold it up to the window. And wow, that looks the same as when you put Elmer's glue on your palm in school and, and hold it up. And, um, and so all those sort of little details um, I'd forgotten about. And, and um, you know, just, if you just sit down, even if it's just for your own family or just for the, for the record, you know, even if you just put it on paper and give it to, leave it for your kids, it's, it's, I think it's such a valuable thing because all of us would have, uh, could add different crazy memories. Some of them would be overlapping, but stuff that we'd forgotten. Some of them would be your own thing. But I remember the frost that would form on the school bus windows. Um, I chaperoned my son's uh, uh, fourth grade trip to the state capitol in Hartford uh, in June. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. You still have to pinch the school bus windows to lift them up and to lower them? I mean, technology has moved on everywhere else, but school buses, you still don't wear seat belts and whatever. But uh, I, the, the, the window would frost and you'd put your side of your fist, you know, some eighth grader showed me this when I first went to school and it would make a, uh, a shape like a foot and then you'd press your fingertip to make the toes, and oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. And <laughs> that's not something I had to re recall because that's something I've done in the bathroom mirror on the shower window <laughs> probably a couple times a week since I was a kid. So I remember the ice forming at the base of the window above my headboard when I was a kid in the winter. And in the morning, I would just get my fingernail under it, and you could, there's a suction to it, but you could pick it off and and what would you do to something ice that had been adhered to your window? Well, you, of course, you'd lick it like a like a you know, ice cube, and um, that that stuff is is uh, sort of as vivid to me now. I, I've forgotten entire years of of school, uh, certainly entire academic uh, years of what I learned then. But I, I I've never forgotten you know peeling the ice off the inside of the window. I've never forgotten before we got central air, lying you know coming in from football practice or just from playing outside and lying on the bed you know, with the fan, oscillating fan on just to cool, cool me off, or uh, the, the playground across the street from our house where if you got on the metal slide, you know, it was 190 degrees and you burn yourself. Or the spinning uh, 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 merry-go-round thing that had about, just about enough clearance to, you know, that your head might clear it or not if, if you fell down the wrong way. Um, all that stuff, and um, you know, my mom, you know, it's a cliche almost, you know, kind of a Facebook meme sort of thing, but it really was true that my mom would say, you know, you gotta, you gotta go out of the house, you can't stay in the house. Well, what am I gonna do? There's nothing to do. Well, find something to do and, and you know, come back at six o'clock for dinner. And so I'd ride my bike around the neighborhood, my non-stingray, and I'd see three stingrays in Kevin's driveway, and gosh, they're having a lot of fun in there, and you'd go in there, and, and your whole purpose was to be older, was to be, you know, you didn't want to be a kid. You wanted to be a big kid. You wanted to be grown up. So the, the stingrays were basically stand-ins for motorcycles. You know, they were called a muscle bikes. Uh, we'd have our candy cigarettes. We'd have you know our shot Dixie Riddle cup shot glasses. You know, at the kitchen counter, and we you know pour me another uh, high C, and you'd toss those back, and then you'd go out and play all day. And uh, um, you know, it was. Uh, 
it, it, it required uh, imagination. And, and so when my mom would say, there's, there's nothing to do, my mom would say, find something to do. What I would do as a kind of a loner, I would go out and I'd take a soccer ball and I'd, you know, oh, I, I kept it, I've headed it seven times. Now I've headed it 27 times. No, now my record is 38. Now my record's 117. Now my record is 405 and pretty, I mean, it, it wasn't like pretty soon, four hours had passed. It seemed like an eternity. But the afternoon had passed and you'd done some nonsense that, uh, that had passed the time. And sometimes the neighborhood kids would join you and um, you know, you'd play Starlight, Moonlight, Have You Seen the Ghost Tonight? The whole, when, from Connecticut, the whole controversy with the Vikings this year of, is it duck, duck, gray duck or duck, duck, goose? I thought, give me a break. It, people, people were saying to me, what? I don't even understand what they're talking about, duck, duck, gray duck. I said, well, you wouldn't understand, but it is, trust me, it is duck, duck, gray duck. And, um, <laughs> but I, I remember playing those games and, um, you know, uh, the board games that we'd play around the kitchen table. You know, oh, I, my brother just lost in sorry. Well, none of you are playing. I'm flipping the board, you know, and, and we're all <laughs> ending in fights and um, all that stuff. So I'm rambling on, but I, I, this is what the book is kind of, you know, uh, about. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's as applicable to a lot of it as, you know, as just childhood. My kids experience some of these same things, but in a different in a different way uh, because uh, they're not riding their bikes around the neighborhood. They're not, uh, you know, they have these distractions that we didn't have. So I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Should I do that now if anybody has any questions? Yes? Any uh, great, you talk about Mets State in the outdoor stadium. Any, well, two-part question, any Mets centers uh, memories where the North Coast Yes, in fact, um, I, I should mention that uh, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through writing a sequel of sorts to this book now. And, and it's focused on the 80s, high school, going off to college. I went to Marquette in Milwaukee, so I, it may as well have been overseas. And then, uh, and then at the very end, going away to New York. And, and I do write about, in that book, working at Met Center. I don't really, I made a lot of hay about working at Met Stadium because it was such a crazy experience, but I, I was a popcorn vendor at Met Center in high school. And um, one, memory, I mentioned it to somebody today at Target Field because we were talking about my experience working at, at that stadium. I, I, I was such an introvert that, you know, doing something like this would have terrified me. I, I couldn't imagine speaking to a group of people. That's why I became a writer in the first place. I could sit alone in a room with my thoughts. It would take me a week to express them and when I was done, there was something there and I would throw it away. But I was, I had to get a job so my mom made me go to Met Center and apply for something. I became a popcorn vendor which requires you to walk around in a crowd of strangers, hockey fans no less, shouting popcorn and get down, I can't see. And, and, uh, and so I would work North Stars games and concerts. And what I remember most is when I finally got up the nerve to shout popcorn in a crowded arena, and then I sort of started getting the swing of it and feeling it. It was at a Kenny Rogers concert. And I'm walking around shouting popcorn as Kenny Rogers is singing Lady, you're my knight in shining, and his ballad, you know. Shut up, we didn't come here to hear you, you know, and I was like, okay, geez. And, and it immediately, like, you know, was my worst nightmare that, oh gosh, they really do hate me, and you know, I'm selling popcorn. So I wasn't good at selling popcorn, but, uh, and I worked at, uh, you know, Tom Thumb convenience store, and, uh, uh, you know, Tommy Kramer, of the, the Vikings quarterback, came in to buy smokeless tobacco, and it's like, it's like that's unbelievable. If, if, if Elvis Presley had walked in and got a, asked me to get a hot dog out of a little Ferris wheel, it would have, would have been no more shocking, you know? I, mean, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, to be up close to those guys and in the case of Met Center to, uh, you know, to, it was such an adult world. And now, I don't remember, in my memory, there weren't a lot of kids at the North Coast Games. There must have been, but I remember guys smoking, swearing, drinking beer. You would go to the Thunderbird Motel bar before the game and maybe after the game. And it was just like an entry into a grown up world. And there's a story in this book on my brother Tom, who's a year older than I, his 10th birthday, my dad took him to a North Stars game. And I was so jealous. It was a Saturday night against the Bruins. And I sat home and watched Mary Tyler Moore and you know, uh, Carol Burnett show and uh, you know, from CBS television city in Hollywood. But my brother was at the North Stars Bruins game. And he didn't get home till really late. And when he got home, we shared a room. He woke me up, and I, or I was still up, and I said, how was it? Oh, it was unbelievable. It was like eight to one, and there was a million fights, and Henry Boucher of the North Stars got his eye knocked out. And that was the night that 
of the, of the famous fight that ended up in a lawsuit and criminal prosecution against Dave Forbes and all this. And, uh, and my brother was there and it just freaked me out and blew my mind. And he now had crossed into a world that, that you know, it was like he left me behind. He was now a grown up. He was, you know, it was his hockey bar mitzvah, more or less. <laughs> and uh, I was just there on the shores, you know, watching him sail away. So I, I, I got a t-shirt. Um, I should have worn it tonight, but it's, on, it's in my the bag of filthy clothes that I'll take back to Connecticut tomorrow. And it says, The Met, but it's a Met Center t-shirt. It's a green t-shirt, and it's got the multicolored seats of Met Center there. You know, the yellow, the white, the gold, the, the black, the gray, whatever. And um, my high school graduation was at, was at Met Center. Now, you know, that's crazy. I mean, I'm on the same stage, more or less, that Led Zeppelin were on, you know, five years ago. What's, what's wrong with this? And, but, uh, Somebody told me when I was wearing this t-shirt this past week, they said, you know the story of that crazy quilt pattern of seats at Met Center? That's because they, you know, it was like any other arena, it's supposed to be, this is the gold section, this is the white section, this is the gray section. Well, they needed, they, they, some event was scheduled uh, last minute and they needed the seats in and they just, so they just threw in the seats willy-nilly. I have no idea if that's true. I desperately want it to be true, but, uh, but whatever they, if, if, if it was an accident or if it was on purpose, it was, it was a distinctive, Thing. And it was, you know, you could only tell how distinctive it was when the seats were empty, of course, and which they often were. But uh, it was, in my mind, it was one of the things that made Minnesota cool was those seats at the Met Center. The other thing were the, the clear plexiglass boards at St. Paul Civic Center. And we used to go to All-Star Wrestling at St. Paul Civic Center. And in, uh, when I was up in Nisswa this week, they said on the radio on the power loon that uh, Jumpin' Jimmy Brunzel was going to be making an appearance and signing autographs somewhere. And that just took me back to we saw jumping Jimmy Brunzel in the high flyers at St. Paul Civic Center. My brother, Tom, was in the audience when Springsteen pulled Courtney Cox out of the audience for the Dancing in the Dark video in 1984 at St. Paul Civic Center. So, um, so many of these memories are tied to these local arenas and stuff. And, uh, you know, that's when before, you know, tickets were $200 and, uh, and, a, and a, a soda was $8 in the case of Target Field today. So, long answer to a short question, but. Yes. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, we grew up in Bloomington in the 80s, and uh, just west of Brookside, okay. where your name yes. was, Brookside Park, just on the west on Franklin yes. Avenue. Big sliding hill. Our house backed up to that in the 80s. So my question is, did, was that a, as popular a sliding yes. hill in the, the I, I can't say this because this will be on television. But uh, there was a horrifying story in the book about Brookside Park and me skating at Brookside Park and me uh, needing a bathroom at Brookside Park <laughs> and knocking, knocking on the door of a house across, across the street. I pray to God it wasn't yours because it didn't end well. And then um, required my mother to come pick me up. So it's a good thing that I followed my mom's advice who always had me, you know, one of my, one of the, I mean, I remember to this day, she always had me memorize our phone number, 888-2872, 888-2872. That was drilled into my head. So in case something, in case a crazy accident ever happened, well, it did happen at Brookside, and I, I had to go to somebody's house, call her, and get out of there as quickly as possible. Um, and another thing I did when I was writing this book and trying to, uh, trying to re-inhabit this childhood was I went on eBay and I found a banana yellow rotary dial telephone with 50 feet of coiled cord like the one we had mounted on the wall in our kitchen. This one wasn't wall mounted because I didn't think my wife would tolerate that, but I have it on my desk where I was writing and it works. It was retrofit with the plug that works. So it, the first time it rang, um, it rang like a, like a fire station. It nearly gave us all a heart attack and I picked it up and, and we'd finally gotten a call and it was uh, my doctor's office, a robo call asking me to press one to confirm my appointment, which I couldn't do on the rotary dial phone. <laughs> So we had to go pick up the landline uh, cordless and do that. But, uh, but my kids loved it. And, um, and you know, again, that the wall-mounted phone, and you would have, you know, who's on the phone? You pick up the extension in my parents' bedroom. Oh, somebody's, somebody's on the phone. So you'd go down to the kitchen, and you'd follow it like a, a miner's landline, like a miner's lifeline. Oh, there's my sister at the bottom of the basement stairs. And, Can you get off the phone? I just got on. And, and, and that's something that my kids, it's a completely, you know, it may as well be the, the the stagecoach or something, and they can't imagine, what are you talking about? You know, your phone wasn't in your pocket, your phone wasn't a TV, it wasn't a computer, it wasn't a uh, communication device, it was, you know, you couldn't text on and all that. 
And, um, you know, that's, uh, but that was it. And, and uh, the, I don't mean to suggest that all of this stuff was better. So much of it was not. It's, it's uh, some of it was crazy, you know? I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, we, I would never let my kids, you know, bike to the places that I routinely, not only was allowed to bike to, but was told, you know? I mean, I worked a job uh, cutting grass on the other side of 494 from in my house, and I, I mean, that was like a, a journey of three days to get there by bike on streets that, you know, my mom didn't care if I was riding my bike across 494 itself, just to have a job. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's no question that, that some of it was, was better in ways, so. Yes, you in the back, yep. I worked with your dad the last, last 10 years at 3M, and uh, about three years ago, he told me you were writing a book. And he told me, he said, if you read it, don't believe everything that's in there. <laughs> so I got the book, I read it on Kindle, and I came back a year later and I said, well, what about the story about you punching the guy out in the <laughs> Well, yeah, that happened. That did happen. <laughs> I would say I would relate to him something that you wrote. Yeah, that happened. Right. <laughs> One other small world story. I'm playing golf with a guy today who I said I was coming to your book signing. He says I played hockey against your brother when he was at Providence and he was at the University really? of Wisconsin. Yeah, my brother, the brother who tortured me. I thought you were going to introduce yourself as his libel attorney. And that, uh, <laughs> you were serving me with papers. So uh, that's a relief because he always tells me, you know, uh, uh, he's going to he's going to take me to court for some of the stuff that I that I wrote about him. But uh, you know, he worked for 3M, and um, to me, it, it, again, it made this place the center of the universe. He worked in the magnetic tape division, so uh, recording tape uh, that recording studios used in in recording albums and television networks. And so he would go to Burbank, California, the home of the Tonight Show, and he'd. You see the set of the you know the Tonight Show, and it, this just blew my mind. How could you? How could somebody walk into the TV and, and you know Johnny Carson doesn't exist in the real world? It was you know, it was unbelievable. And my friend Mike in the back here sent me a, a, a link the other day to Rodney Dangerfield appearing on the Tonight Show, and Rodney mentioned you know when they plug their their next gig, he said I'm going to be appearing at the Carlton Celebrity Room in Bloomington, Minnesota, and and Johnny said, isn't that the land of a thousand lakes? And and it didn't matter if he butchered it. Johnny Carson no, has heard, somebody just mentioned Bloomington, Minnesota, the Johnny Carson, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. You know, how is that possible? And, and Bloomington was, my dad would bring back newspapers from places he traveled to. Before there was internet, the only way I could read, you know, the LA Times is my dad brought one back from LA three days later and I could read Jim Murray in the LA Times sports section and this guy who was a smart aleck for a living. How can you do that? He write, you know, the trouble with Spokane, Washington is there's nothing to do there after 10 in the morning. <laughs> but it's a great place to have breakfast. And I thought, God, if I could do that for a living, you know, that'd be uh, the greatest thing ever. And so, um, so, you know, to me, and my dad, it, it was hilarious because he'd go call on all these recording studios and, you know, Dad, did you see anybody? Yeah, I can't remember what they were called because he didn't listen to music. He, he had an AM radio until it was no longer possible to only get an AM radio in your car. And then he had an FM, but he was still only listening to WCCO. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'd always boast, I completely missed Elvis, I completely missed the Beatles. There were a couple of songs that lodged in his brain. To this day, he will still sing only this part of, of Willie Nelson's On the Road Again. And then he'll go back into On the Road Again. And, and, and somehow that stuck from his years of listening to AM radio. Um, so we always thought that was hilarious because for all he knew, for all we know, he was, he was you know, hobnobbing with... Paul McCartney and Wings or something in a, in a studio, but he just didn't have any idea who Paul McCartney was, so, which is admirable. Yes, in the, in the way back. So, so you got the phone? Did you ever get the Stingray bicycle? Or I did not. I did not. And and somebody here was somebody was showing me uh, a Stingray on uh, eBay for seventeen hundred dollars just tonight, and uh, and but I've thought about it, and I mean I would be a circus bear riding around on the little bicycle. <laughs> So I couldn't ride it, but I could mount it on the wall. I've seen them mounted on, on walls. I've seen them hanging from ceilings in restaurants. And last year, this past holiday season, Dick's Sporting Goods were, were offering them for, for sale, uh, just a silver, uh, the, the silver Stingray for uh, $400, a reproduction, but it looks exactly like it. But I don't know what I would do with it other than you know, keep it under glass 
and just kind of and put it on like a, a rotating motorized lazy Susan and just gaze at it every once in a while as uh, if it were uh, the crown jewels, which which I may still do. But uh, my kids, you know, when they're here in the Twin Cities, they they we rode we rode our bikes, we rode borrowed bikes and rode them around Lake Harriet the other day. And I wish they could do that where we are in Connecticut. We're, we're um, in a place where they can ride bikes on the cul-de-sac and the little neighborhood across the street, but otherwise they're sort of hemmed in by, you know, uh, high-speed uh, two-lane roads. And so I think that's something that, that they definitely miss. They have bikes. They know how to ride them. Um, but uh, they, don't, they don't long for, like, a specific bike, you know. I hate to say it, but they want, uh, you know, my daughter just graduated from eighth grade, and told us repeatedly that she was the last person in her class to get a cell phone. And so that was her, her thing. And um, it, that's something I think we've definitely lost is, you know, instead of being out on a bike, that, that thing is constantly in your pocket. Um, one of the differences between the 70s and now, we would get the afternoon paper, the Minneapolis Star. And once an afternoon, somebody would throw the news in your driveway, all of the news, good and bad, there it is in your driveway. My dad would get home from work and he'd sit in front of the network news reading the Minneapolis Star. And in 30 minutes, bam, you've got all of the world's bad news out of the way. And then 24 hours later, same ritual. Get the news, read it, you know, done the next day. Now it's streaming in your pocket, the bad news. It's, it's on your nightstand and it wakes you in the, in the morning and it feels like you're constantly under siege. And, uh, you know, the main news story that dominated my child, the two main ones were Watergate and Vietnam. I didn't have any idea what either of these complicated things was. I remember asking my dad specifically, Dad, what is Watergate? And he's like, he looks over at the paper and says, yeah, we'll talk about that, you know, we'll talk about that one of these days of what it's about. And um, eventually I read, you know, all the president's men and stuff. And but Vietnam was even more uh, murky. It was on the news all the time, in the car, on the car radio, on the TV news. And, and as a weird kid with a... a an affection for words and wordplay and figuring out, you know, I like the fact that the word win was concealed in, in the word twins, you know, even though the twins didn't win a whole lot then. But Vietnam, sometimes I'd see it spelled as one word, sometimes I'd see it spelled as two words, Viet and then capital N, Nam. And, and I knew they were trying to, you know, either unite or divide the country or South Vietnam and North Vietnam. And, and part of me, in my little kid brain, thought something, it had something to do with you know, dividing and uniting the word Vietnam itself. Like, you know, now it's Viet and Nam. Now it's Vietnam, one word. And, um, and you know, it's something I couldn't have understood as a kid, but it was, it was this constant uh, for years, Vietnam and Watergate. And, uh, um, and I think Watergate in particular, you know, all the president's men, it made, it made a brief fashion for these, you know, uh, journalists and, and, you know, Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford Imagine Robert Redford playing a newspaper guy today. Ridiculous. But uh, then it was plausible. And I think that's one of the things that vaguely gave me the idea of being a writer. And I thought, you know, you'd wear a fedora with a press card and your hat band and you'd be a real gumshoe, even though that wasn't my personality. I didn't know what a gumshoe was. But, uh, you know, you met people in parking garages and had secret conversations. So all of that fed into my, uh, my becoming a writer. Yes. Um, you were brought up in the Twin Cities, one of the local sports writers in the Polish shop. Right. I've always thought that your um, writing styles are very similar. Like you both have uh, your tongue in cheek and uh, play with words and things. And I was wondering, I assume you read them. Absolutely. So I was wondering if you had any influence on your. Yeah, I think, I, absolutely. And I think uh, there were other writers in the local papers who did, um, and, and not even always in print. So Jim Klobuchar is one in, in the book that I'm writing now. The title is called Knights in White Castle. And because White Castle was our hangout in, in high school. And every night, no matter, even if, you know, if you went to All Star Wrestling, you ended up White Castle. If you went to prom, you ended up at White Castle. If you went out to dinner, you went to White Castle after to prove you could eat more, as in the case of my brother who had a pizza eating contest at Pizza Hut and then white, went to White Castle after winning that to show that he was, you know, he, he was still hungry. And you would get a slider with vinyl or a gobbler with glue and, uh, you know, and you <laughs> ate them in minimal units of 10. So when I, was, when I was researching how many White Castles there were in the Twin Cities, what, what a White Castle cost in 1984 and all this, I came across a Jim Klobuchar column from the early 80s where he just hung out at White Castle at like 2 o'clock in the morning or something. And he had it pegged so perfectly 
because it was the Star Wars cantina. Um, you know, <laughs> where I went at 94th and Lindell, was Howard Wong's was across the street, and um, or, yeah, David Fong's is across the street. I, I always mix up David Fong's in central Wilmington, Howard Wong's, which used to be on the strip. And uh, Fong's is still there, and, and people would come from the bar, Fong's, people would come from next door at Beanie's Arcade, so you got the kid who was playing Pac-Man, and the guy who, you know, just had a, a double shot of Jack Daniels, and then there was people coming from Lindell Lane's a block away, and uh, it, all ages, all backgrounds, all hungry for White Castle, but a, a crazy kind of scene in there. And uh, uh, Mike and I, when I was here in May for something, I said, we gotta go to White Castle, you know, I just wanna, you know, re, you know, what it smells like and all that. Of course, it's completely different. The logos changed, the place's landscape, the parking lot wasn't what it once was. The, uh, the security guard who used to chase us out of there and, and in fact banned one of our best friends for life uh, was no longer there. But, uh, but you, could still, you could still walk up and order a slider with vinyl. They knew exactly, a box of nails. They knew exactly what you're talking about. And there was a guy uh, sitting there and we couldn't figure out if he was, if he was a falconer or a professional bowler, or what he had some kind of Velcro suede arm thing on. There was another guy in a sort of admiral's hat, but not from the U.S. Navy, from some vague Navy, uh, from somewhere else with sort of epaulets and stuff. And, and I just, it was everything that I, I remembered it to be. And if you run a time capsule of what White Castle was like in the late 70s, they were, all, they were built to be, all be the same. So they were you know, prefab, every White Castle is gonna look the same. They were white to look super clean. and. You had these stainless steel tables and tile floors as if it were an operating theater and, uh, or, or perhaps a, a, you know, a jail cell. And, um, but there's a scene in Saturday Night Fever where, where John Travolta and his buddies, Double J and those guys, they go into a White Castle. This one's in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, but it's exactly the same as the one on Lindale. And as, on their way out, one of them jumps up on top of the table and he's like, you know, jumping around like he's a gorilla or something and he's spitting food all over the place. And the beauty of that scene is Nobody looks at him. Nobody looks at him. Nobody's, they just go on in the background eating their burgers and they kind of like disappointed and goes out in the parking lot and that's exactly what it was like. So, so um, you know, when I think about high school and, and the book that I'm writing now, that you know, White Castle just looms, looms so large and of course the place was lit like a, like a hopper painting. It was, you could see it from outer space and it had to be because the stuff going on in the parking lot or inside, you know, they had to, they had to light it so that uh, you know, the police could see what was going on there as they, as they drove by, but uh, anyway. Anybody? Yes. Um, I've actually bought your book twice because um, I read it cover to cover and set it down at home and my dog ate it. <laughs> just, like, just like I taught her, yes. yes. <laughs> so um, there's a group of six or eight of us girls that um, have read your book and shared stories from it. And um, I just wanted to thank you today for taking us back um, to a time of innocence like you mentioned. And, and to thank you for, to, for taking us down memory lane again. And the, we've committed to, our, our small group has committed to read the book together once a year and oh, then that's... gather and talk about it. So we're really Well, thank, no, thank you. That, I can't tell you how much that, how gratifying that is to hear. I really, I mean, I, when you write a book like this, um, first of all, you know, the nerve to, who cares about my childhood, you know? And why would anybody be interested in it? And, and to hear, as I have, I mean, never as eloquently as this, but as I, as I have in this past year, from people who um, not only shared some of those memories, but, but it caused their families or their friends to share you know, their memories of what their specific childhood was and their group of friends and all that. That is so gratifying to me. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm on a Facebook group of people from Bloomington. They just post random, you know, look at this matchbook from Eddie Webster's, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was in our, you know, my parents' cabin, all these matchbooks that were so alluring, you know. Uh, the rusty scupper, what is that place like, you know? Everybody's in a Captain and Tennille hat, and you know? And, um, and so, you know, it's great that, that it resonated with anybody, but particularly when I'm here in the Twin Cities and the specific places and the specific memories from that time. Um, uh, there's a blurb on the back of the book from Craig Finn of The Hold Study, a band I love, and he, he's, he's, you know, got these lyrics about specific places. And there's a song called Southtown Girls that says, Take Lindale to the horizon, take Nicolet out to the ocean, take Penn Ave out to the 494, meet me right in front of the fabric store. And that to me is like, <laughs> man, that is Southtown there. And, and he, he, so the way I kind of came in contact with him was um, uh, somebody, somebody I think on Twitter said, um, you know, Steve, 
you should, I, I'd, love, I'd love to hear it. I think, I think this is to a mutual friend who's uh, on the Twins broadcast team. Steve, I'd love to hear you on a pregame show um, talking about your Twins memories with Craig Finn and his Twins memories. And, and I replied to this guy saying, I would only bore him with stories about the Southtown Theater in Southtown because we go there all the time. And he replied shortly after saying, try me. So I said, well, you know, Craig, I, I went to uh, see Return of the Jedi at the Southtown Theater and uh, hid in the bathroom until it, st until it started, until the opening credits started, with my feet up above the stall so f to get in free. Because we, we would sneak into movies all the time, usually through the back door. We'd, we'd have the lock latched at Southdale. And whatever movie that was showing there, it's Theater 3, whether it was you know, a love story or a comedy, well, it's free. So in, 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 until they found the duct tape on the back door, we'd go in there. I didn't personally do this, of course, but I followed my friends in there. <laughs> so I said, I said uh, you know, um, I said, uh, you know, I did this for Return of the Jedi, and he, he replies, I did the same thing for Empire Strikes Back. So like instantly, you know, you realize that there were a lot more of, of kids like yourself, and I was a pretty good kid, I like to think, but we still did things that I'm horrified by. Um, you know, we got a, a fire extinguisher, filled it with water out of, out of when Lincoln High School closed, and, and, you know, friends would drive around and, excuse me, sir, do you have the time? Somebody's walking their dog. They'd come over to be helpful, and they'd spray the person with water or something. And um, I, this, the, the, the beauty is that karma comes back to you. So when I was up in Nisswa on the running path into the bike path into town, it's going for a run, and on July 3rd, and it was woods on this side and woods on the other side. And as I was running, I shoot bang, 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 and, and a string of firecrackers went off right near me in the woods. And and I thought. Do you remember when you were a kid and, and you might have set off firecrackers too close to like a middle-aged guy on his bike and he shook his fist at you? Well, I'm the middle-aged guy now. I'm no longer the kid doing the firecrackers. And that's the circle of life, you know, it's as it should be. I, there needs to be that kid and there needs to be a guy like me now going, why you, I ought to, you know, and like Grandpa Simpson. So, um, but uh, yeah, all these, all these memories, uh, it's so gratifying to hear because something that somebody likened it to, not me, but People have brought up um, Gene Shepard, who wrote the, Chris, the, the, the books that A Christmas Story became based on. And you're going to shoot your eye out with the, uh, with the BB gun. Uh, the, there are those objects. You know, that was the 1940s. You know? For me, it was the, the Schwinn Stingray. When, when um, my, my editor said younger people at the publishing house, they had their own Schwinn Stingray. Everybody had their sort of rosebud from, uh, from Citizen Kane. And uh, you know, my own kids have you know their wish list. And one of the things that's in the book, uh, real quickly, is the Sears Christmas wish book, the Christmas catalog. And we would, I didn't know that this thing arrived in September. My mom would put it up in you know December, right after Thanksgiving. And my oldest brother would get it first. Then my brother Tom would get it. And by the time I got it, it was dog-eared. Pages had been torn out. Stuff had been circled. Mustaches had been drawn on the <laughs> underwear models. And and uh, and they knew exactly what they wanted. And then I'd get to look through this heavily thumbed thing and. You know, gosh, look at those NFL pajamas with like the Vikings helmet on them. Unbelievable! I could never ask for that, but maybe I'll shoot a little lower for the you know the, the NFL pillowcase or something. And um, and when the book came out, and I wrote about you know, the Sears Christmas wish book, I had a knock on my door in the small town I live in in Connecticut, in suburban Hartford, and uh, there was a guy on a parked his bike, and he was in the whole lycra the what they call in England, they call them mammals, middle-aged men in Lycra. This was a mammal, and he came and knocked on the door, and, uh, and I opened the door, and he said, uh, here, you should have this. And it was a 1978 pristine Sears Christmas wish book. And I said, I'm not worthy. I can't take this. I, I mean, you could sell this on eBay for 80 bucks. He's like, no, you should have it. It was sitting around our house. It has been for years. None of us has ever looked at it. Take it. OK, I'll take it. And I sat down with that thing and just I mean, it's, it, is a, it is a hot tub time machine, man. It, it's, the, the, the stuff is, it is right in my wheelhouse. I was uh, 12, Christmas of 1978. I remember everything that I wanted in that wish book. And uh, so, uh, and my sister-in-law, my wife's sister at a garage sale bought a stack of pristine, now this was contraband. I, I still felt afraid to open these because I wasn't allowed to have them, but maybe 40 1970s Mad Magazines. And some of those back, Cover things hadn't even been folded together, so I mean this was really great stuff. And uh, uh, you know, I, I probably should live some in the present, you know. But uh, but I, I have enjoyed paging through Sears catalogs, Mad magazines, with my rotary dial phone, and uh, you know, living in the past. 
Anyone? Yes. Okay. One, one more. Okay. Sure. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, I mean, you talk about the way things are different. BAA, we had a blue T-shirt. I was in North. We had. And I've got. There's pictures in the book. I'm in my plaid Thera slacks as my game pants, you know, and uh, I have vivid memories of my parents not being. At, for, first of all, parents go to practices now, you know, and stay for the practice. I have vivid memories of, of my parents not only not being at many, if not most, of my games. My not wanting or caring that they weren't there. It was it was like you know, kids playing baseball. Um, but uh, yeah, North had a kid named Craig Welna who was bigger than everybody, uh, stronger than everybody. You know, had a beard and mustache at age eight, and and <laughs> and we were all terrified of facing him. And to this day, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't wouldn't get in the batter's box against Craig Welna just from you know my memories as a kid. But my my oldest brother who. Um, you know, I mentioned terrified me. He was a pitcher throughout BAA, a left-hander, and then at Lincoln High School. And when I became a baseball, and he would always say how he ended up playing hockey, but he always said, you know, he owned Herbeck, and, you know, when he was pitching in BAA and in uh, high school. And when I became a baseball writer, he, I said, well, I'm going to ask Herbeck this. And I remember one day Herbeck was still playing for the Twins, and I said. Um, I said, first of all, the way I met Herbeck, because we both went to Kennedy, but he was, he was six years ahead of me. I was walking through the Twins Clubhouse one day, and I was wearing black uh, Adidas high tops. There were nothing remarkable about them, but he just, he just said to me, Psh, nice shoes, and, but as, as like derogatorily. And I said, uh, OK, whatever. And then the next day, I introduced myself to him. I was writing a story about Tom Kelly, and he says, oh, you're the guy who went to Kennedy. I said, yeah. He said, Sorry about the crack about the shoes, man. And, uh, and so we started talking, and I said, hey, uh, Kent, my brother always claims to have owned you in, in BAA in high school. And Herbeck said, was your brother a left-hander? And I said, yeah. He said, red hair? And I said, yeah. He said, kind of like an afro? And I said, yes. I couldn't believe that, he, that this was proving to be true. And Herbeck just went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Which, when I repeated this verbatim to my brother, he said, see? I did own it. He, he remembers me, you know? How would he not remember me? But think of all the guys who have come up to Herbeck in bars at the sports page or wherever over the years and said, you know, my brother claimed he owned you in BAA, you know? Pretty much everybody who, who faced him. But that's my overriding memory of BAA. And I still look, though, on eBay for a Blue North BAA 1970s era hat. They've got to be out there. I would, uh, I'd wear that thing uh, to formal events. So. But thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. It's been great.